Good evening. On behalf of the Los Angeles Review of Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion, Hong Kong Against the Odds. At a time when the sheer amount of news out there tempts us to reduce difficult situations to sound bites and headlines just to make it through the day, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to all of you for setting aside the next hour and a half to join us. While this is the first such event on Hong Kong that LARP has hosted, the practice of valuing nuanced, well-researched, and time-intensive takes is, of course, essential to the work that we do as a book review, magazine, and nonprofit literary arts organization. So to those of you who are old friends of ours, thank you for your continued support of LARB. And to those of you who are new to us, we are thrilled to have you and welcome you to learn more about us and our work at lareviewofbooks.org. I'm Irene Yim, the Publishing work Workshop Director here at LARB, and it's my honor to introduce our guests this evening, Samuel Chu, Mary Kay Magstad, Jeff Wasserstrom, and Congressman Katie Porter, who will be joining us in a little while. Uh, first, a quick note of, regarding the format of the discussion. Tonight's conversation will take place in two parts. For the first half hour, Samuel, Mary Kay, and Jeff will discuss the origins and dimensions of the pro-democracy movement in Hong Kong and its place within China's domestic sphere. We'll then open it up to some questions from you, the audience, followed by a second round of discussion joined by Congressman Porter about the protest movement's international implications, about US involvement, and the economic forces at play. The event will conclude with another round of questions from the audience. If you'd like to submit a question, please use the Zoom Q&A function or the YouTube live chat. We understand that this is a sensitive subject that may elicit strong sentiments, but we do request that all participants keep their discourse productive and respectful. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speakers. Samuel Chu is the founding managing director of the Hong Kong Democracy Council, a DC-based nonprofit organization dedicated to raising support and awareness in the US and abroad for democracy and human rights in Hong Kong. Samuel's long career in activism started earlier than most when, as an 11-year-old, he went with his father to visit Chinese political dissidents that they were helping to smuggle out of Hong Kong in the aftermath of Tiananmen Square. Here in the US, Samuel was the founding president of One LA Industrial Areas Foundation, a broad-based coalition mobilizing local communities in Los Angeles to take actions on issues such as healthcare for all, criminal justice reform, and housing security. And he continues to lead local and national advocacy campaigns around issues of food insecurity as a national organizer for the Jewish nonprofit Mazon. Because of his work with HKDC, Samuel was unfortunately one of the first activists the Chinese government issued an arrest warrant for shortly after the implementation of the Hong Kong national security law this summer, which I'm sure we'll discuss further in tonight's conversation. Mary Kay Magstad is creator and host of the podcast On China's New Silk Road through the Global Reporting Center. In it, Mary Kay partners with local journalists on five continents to provide an in-depth examination of China's sweeping global infrastructure initiative and, its impact, and the impact its investments are having on the ground. It's a truly fascinating podcast and the fifth of nine episodes just dropped today. So if you haven't listened to it yet, you have time to catch up before the sixth one comes out next week. Uh, Mary Kay brings to her podcast and tonight's conversation over two decades of experience covering China and Southeast Asia as an award-winning foreign correspondent for the Washington Post, NPR, NPRX is the world. During that time, Mary Kay opened the Beijing Bureau of NPR and was on the ground to cover, among many other things, the handover of Hong Kong to China in 1997. Congresswoman Katie Porter, some of you no doubt know as your House Representative for California's 45th District. Many others still may recognize her from her tough and effective questioning of administrative um, administration officials and bank executives on the Hill, including, I think, today. <laughs> Before her election to Congress, Representative Porter spent nearly two decades advocating on behalf of consumers and families as a, protection, as a consumer protection attorney, law professor, and California's independent watchdog against the banks in the aftermath of the housing crisis. And long before that, she had spent time living and teaching in Hong Kong. So we're looking forward to having Congresswoman Porter join us later this evening. Jeff Wasserstrom is Chancellor's Professor of History at UC Irvine, where he also holds a joint appointment in law and literary journalism. Jeff is the advising editor for China here at the Los Angeles Review of Books and the founding editor of the China Channel, a LARB affiliate dedicated to covering China's culture, society, and history, and all the complexity. A historian of China and social movements, Jeff is the author of numerous books. His most recent, Vigil, Hong Kong on the Brink, offers a thoughtful and compelling synthesis of the historical circumstances undergirding this most recent round of demonstrations in Hong Kong. But as 2020 and all of its whatever the opposite of glory is, 
has more fully unfolded since its publication. I'm sure there's plenty more for him to help us tackle on the subject. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff, who will be moderating tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Irene. It's really been a pleasure working with you to put this uh, together. And it's a great pleasure for me to be reunited with Samuel and Mary Kay, both of whom I've done events with about Hong Kong earlier in the period. Um, Samuel and I were on a Pacific Council for International Policy event. Um, we met a couple of years ago at a very different stage in the Hong Kong story. And Mary Kay uh, moderated an event with me early in um, this year, one of those, um, which now seems very, very long ago because it was when we could have live events um, up in San Francisco with the World Affairs Council. So I thought to get things going, um, maybe Samuel, if you could um, talk about what's going on, what's going on now, the, the sort of latest, the last year, a quick sense of what uh, you think of as the key things happening um, in the last year. And then we'll move back, scale back in time and place that into a larger perspective. But I think to just say, what do you think is key for people to know about what's been happening in Hong Kong in the last year? You need to, yes. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. And, um, and thank you, um, uh, Ellery Rivas of Books and Irene and, and Mary Kay uh, for uh, joining and, and being part of this. Um, I, I, this is, uh, I, I've, I've been asked to try to do this, you know, in two minutes or less uh, to get like a explanation about what is actually happening. Uh, but I, uh, I, I'm still not great at it, but I'll give my best shot. Uh, I think that for most people, when they see the headline in, about Hong Kong, they see sort of uh, pictures of these mass uh, marches of protests or confrontation between protesters and uh, police and arrests and, and other things. I think that um, it is very hard sometimes, I think particularly for American public and, and media to be able to get deeper into the, the, the historic but also underlying causes. So I, I, I'll put it this way, I think that um, you know, in the, in the more global sense, and we'll get into deeper that, um, you know, Hong Kong was promised and guaranteed when it was handed back over from British rule to China that it would have autonomy and basic rights in its own set of law and all the freedom that it has enjoyed uh, for 50 years, which is until 2047. Alongside of that, there were reforms that were promised. So there's not just guarantee of existing rights, but there were political reform like open election that was promised when the handover took place in 97. What happened this past year is really a coming up head of um, a, a complete breakdown of the Hong Kongers uh, sense of trust that any of those guarantees, the rule of law or promised reform is going to or are going to come about or become a reality at all. Uh, so a year, a little over a year and a half ago, actually, I was actually in Hong Kong, my father who was on trial last year. Uh, for the role that he played along with other leaders for the 2014 umbrella movement um, right around this time six years ago. Um, Hong Kong government quietly proposed a extradition bill that would essentially say that uh, Hong Kong government would have an agreement with mainland China to transfer those who are charged under Chinese law or you know, sought for whatever reason and allow them to be extradited to be tried and um, in mainland China under mainland law. And this is not the first time that the Chinese government had tried to do this. Uh, this happened in 20, 2003, half a million people showed up on the street and beat it back. This really became, came to a head in, in June when it became clear that this could be used essentially as a method of crackdowns and, and, and silencing opposition. And so what we saw then in the Western sort of American news media is of the 1 million and 2 million people that took to the street in June was really a reaction to you promised us autonomy. You gave us this separate rule of law. This violates that. And so what you have then seen is that when that, um, the only really concession that were made by the government was that they suspended. So I think it's, it's key to remember that we did get a concession, at least partial, that they suspended that bill. But I think that what became clear was that as the protests continue and now lasting almost 18 months now, uh, is that 
there is a complete breakdown of the trust that the people in Hong Kong have on their own government. And so even as government has come out and say that they're going to suspend the role, they've now banned the large assembly, protesters continue to take to the street because they see that if their government isn't representing them, um, they will continue to fight because there's a fundamental breakdown and fundamental lack of uh, accountability in the government. So the five demands that emerged from the protests in June was about how the government treated protesters, about the 10,000 or so now protesters who have been arrested, about the extradition bill not just being suspended but being withdrawn, um, and this promised political reform that is supposed to come. And I think that because of the way that this persisted, the Chinese government in June, in May, actually su uh, suggested that they would impose arbitrarily and sort of just uh, on their own, bypassing the Hong Kong legislature and constitutions, a national security measure that is actually even worse than the extradition bill that they had proposed. And that national security law essentially have outlawed any sort of dissent. So what you have seen in the last two months of the two and a half months of the implementation of the law, and the law actually was passed by the Chinese legislature without being made public at all until it went into effect in Hong Kong. So in the last three months, we've seen the outlaw of protest slogans. You can't wear a t-shirt that says liberate Hong Kong, which has been a popular slogan. You have teenagers who have been arrested based on their social media posting because they were accused of being separatists. The largest opposition newspaper, Newsroom, were raided by 200 police and the founder arrested for you know, probably like the 12 times in the last year. And then on July 31st, I became the first American citizen and foreign citizen to be charged for colluding with foreign forces, which essentially is just me doing my constitutionally protected rights of advocating for Hong Kong in the US, that an arrest warrant was issued for six overseers. And then the most latest, uh, we saw 12 Hong Kong protesters who were facing charges, try to escape to Taiwan on a boat. They were picked up, arrested, and now indefinitely detained in China without access to their higher legal counsel, without communication with their family. And so all the things that you're seeing have actually come to uh, reality. And, and I think that this is important to keep in mind that this is not something that spontaneously combusted a year and a half ago. This has been a steady, consistent um, fight against the erosion of what was promised to Hong Kongers. And then this past year of this outright break of China no longer honoring the international treaty and the agreement that China made to guarantee Hong Kong's autonomy and basic rights until 2047. So that is my best version of China explaining how we've came to here. That's wonderful, very, very clear on many things. And I think, can we take this back in time to fill in some of the gaps? Mary Kay, you were covering, you've covered Hong Kong, you covered the handover itself in 1997, and you've been, you spent a lot of time going back and forth between Beijing and Hong Kong. So what, what stands out for you as, as key moments in the past and even things that are sort of recurrences of things that you remember from, from the past that you're now seeing happening again? So I actually lived in Hong Kong in 1995-96 um, in the lead up to the handover. And at the time, people were very anxious and they were very careful. You know, I was going around with a microphone and asking people what they thought about the political situation, what they were going to do about it. And a lot of people were like, I, I'm not going to talk to you on mic, maybe off mic. Uh, there was a lot of um, uncertainty about, you know, what, what is this going to feel like the day after the handover? What's it going to feel like three months later, six months later? And while some people welcomed the handover, you know, they're, you know, they didn't have a lot of love lost for the British. Others were really scared. Some people left. Some people got passports just in case. Um, when I covered the handover, I remember, you know, in the wee hours, actually it was almost dawn, watching, you know, the APCs coming over from China. And um, there were Hong Kong journalists there with me on the road. And they're just like, you know, where, where will this lead? You know, what, you know, is, is our life 
changing uh, forever right now. And it turned out that it didn't really right away. And I think that opened a certain kind of space. And I'd really be interested in hearing Samuel's take on this, but let me just kind of go through a couple of things that I, I found rather striking at the time. That um, slowly over the, the last part of the 90s, you know, 98, 99, there was still room for free speech. Um, there were still um, dissidents who were living in Hong Kong and working in Hong Kong. Han Dong Fang, who had been an activist in Tiananmen, uh, a, a worker, went and started, you know, he was involved in starting China Labor Bulletin in Hong Kong. You know, Human Rights Watch had an office in Hong Kong. You know, other dissidents did as well. And, uh, or not dissidents, activist groups, human rights groups, et cetera. And, and so I think there was to some extent a feeling of, well, if this space is here, let's use it. And we can relax a little bit and speak our minds and, and say, you know, we have rule of law. We have 50 years of having a separate way of, of living in Hong Kong. And maybe we can set an example. I think some people felt this. I'm not sure that it was, I'm not sure how widespread it was, but an important cohort of the Hong Kong population felt it. Felt, you know, let's, let's make sure we protect this space. So then I was gone from the region for three years. And when I came back in 2003, it was striking to me how much more activated the population, a bigger part of the population was. So I was there in 2000, 2003 when there was a half million person protest on a very hot steamy day in the middle of summer um, but it was so peaceful and it was families with their kids and older people. And it was just saying, we don't want an anti-sedition law, which had been proposed. You know, we have the right to keep our way of life here. The group came out again in 2004 when the regulation, when the law was um, proposed again, and again, they pushed it back. And in this time, a generation was growing up in Hong Kong that was seeing all this happen and thinking, we have the right to push back. We have the right to protect our space, our civil rights. And then in the, in the next years, it, it was interesting seeing how this group of younger people, um, as, as they came of age, as they became older teenagers and in their, in their early 20s, were willing to be a little bit more assertive. And I think the police didn't really at first know quite how to deal with that. And I'm not saying, you know, violent or aggressive. I'm just saying, you know, that they were speaking up more and, and, you know, maybe asserting that they had a separate Hong Kong identity, something I wasn't hearing people say as much before. Um, and, and this is precious to us and we want to keep this. And then on the negative side, I think there was a certain amount of chauvinism toward mainland Chinese who were coming in, which antagonized a lot of mainland Chinese. And so in Beijing, I was hearing um, a lot of, you know, kind of outrage about, you know, how dare they talk about us like this? How come, you know, like th there, there, were vid there was a video that went around of, you know, look at these Chinese who are eating food on the subway, you know, they, you know have they no couth, have they no manners? And, um, and so there was a sort of a tension building on both sides. Uh, in, in Hong Kong, you know, feeling affronted of, you know, how could you be, you know, squeezing our rights, which was happening gradually throughout this time. But in Beijing thinking, you should be grateful to us. You know, you have all of these rights, you have all of this room, and still you, you insult us. And so, I mean, I think that just kind of each fed off the other and it led to the kinds of confrontations that have happened more in the last five years. I mean, that's what I see as an outsider, um, you know, who was there briefly, living there briefly, and then visiting frequently. But, um, you know, Jeff, you visited quite often. And Samuel, you're, you're from Hong Kong. What do you guys think? So, no, I think this, this sets a lot in, in the picture that's very important. I think it's important to remember what an extraordinary experiment in some ways Hong Kong was that after the handover, there had never been a case of a city that was part of a Communist Party run country in which things were done so differently. And I think there were things that were left unresolved and Samuel brought up the fact there was supposed to be a move toward democratic elections. The chief executive in Hong Kong 
is elected, but only fewer than 2,000 people vote and uh, they're vetted candidates. But one of the things that was really special, you knew you were in Hong Kong rather than a place on the mainland because the courts would sometimes rule against the government. Uh, somebody would be arrested and then they would be out on bail and giving uh, interviews right afterwards. There were the newspapers would criticize local uh, policies and uh, national policies. There was a satirical television show that made fun of the British colonial authorities and then after 1997 toggled to making fun of the Chinese Communist Party authorities. And that was something where you, it was really extraordinary. It was something that I think we need to keep in mind that it, that it can seem naive. How could people have believed that these promises of some degree of autonomy would really be, be lived up to when the Chinese Communist Party has always put such a premium on control? But it really was quite amazing there. And they were never, local people didn't take them for granted and pushed back when they were, when there was a threat to them and achieved some victories along the way. In 2012, there was an effort to bring in um, patriotic education, a term that has recently come into the news in America in a disturbing way. Um, and protesters, including a young Joshua Wong and Agnes Chow, who have remained uh, key figures in the protests, as, as teenagers pushed back against that and helped galvanize people to, and the, the, the local government um, retracted it. They pulled back. So there was, there was a push and pull throughout this period. Um, I think one of the things that gets in the way in some cases of, of Americans, I think, appreciating just how worrisome things have been happening recently is in the minds of a lot of Americans is, is Tiananmen. Tiananmen haunts this story in many different ways. And what is remembered about that in, um, in the West is largely the massacre of early June. And there hasn't been a massacre like that. So when people would say, when I would talk about how I had studied Tiananmen and now I was studying the Hong Kong protests, one question would be, will there be a Tiananmen? By which often they meant, will there be soldiers firing on crowds in the streets? And I think what's, to get to the moment now, there hasn't been that. But there were a whole bunch of other things that were part of the Tiananmen repression and a whole bunch of other things have happened. There have been um, massive numbers of arrests. There have been people fleeing into exile. And uh, in Samuel's own life, he helped his father with exiles from Tiananmen coming into Hong Kong. And now there's a period, that's what Hong Kong was a place where people fled oppression to get to. And now things have gone such a change that it's a place people are, are fleeing out. And another thing that Samuel said that, that made me think about it, that now wearing a t-shirt uh, can get you arrested in Hong Kong. It used to be that you knew you were in Hong Kong because you could sort of say whatever you wanted to a large extent. You certainly were always freer to say things than you were on the mainland. And now in a sense, if you wore a t-shirt that said, long live Shanghai in Shanghai, that wouldn't be a problem. But, long, but glory to Hong Kong could get you in trouble in Hong Kong. So it's, it's this strange thing that Hong Kong still has some degrees of freedom uh, more than the mainland in terms of news and other kinds of things. But in some ways it's leapfrogged from being by far the freest part of the People's Republic of China to a place that in some really disturbing ways looks a little bit like the least free places in the People's Republic of China. Places like Xinjiang and Tibet where the government, if you protest the government um, treat you as a terrorist or a separatist. So it's a very strange um, shake and that, that has happened really very, very recently. But I'd love to hear you just Samuel responding to anything that either Mary Kay or I've said in this little bit. Yeah, I think a few things that um, struck me, struck me uh, uh, in your comments about, um, well, first of all, I think that it is important for people to realize that Hong Kong has never been a democratic society. There has never actually been a freely elected self-governing uh, infrastructure in Hong Kong. It was a colonial state um, 
there was during a brief moment between the 84 joint agreement um, and declaration to the 97 handover, which actually my father uh, was participating in, a push to open elections before the handover. Because I think people at that point already realized that there needed to be some kind of accountability and some way of political uh, agency, or this might not work. Um, and that the Chinese government shut down, the, the CCP completely shut down that effort to, to open up election. Uh, so I, I think that there is a sense sometimes that like, oh, let's go back to where we were. We're actually, this movement has never been about going back to where we were. And I think that that's what made the last six, seven years or so, I think so um, different is that people realize that we have always been fighting for every inch that we are moving. We're not trying to defend something in the back. We're actually trying to, not just to preserve, but to create the kind of democratic and open society in Hong Kong that we actually wanted. And so uh, when people fought for election in 2014, for example, and that led to Occupy Central, led to the Umbrella Movement, it's not like we have ever elected our chief executive. <laughs> it's not like that our legislature was ever freely elected. And I think that that's important because I think that at the end of the day, that I think was, it's really at the bottom of this, is that the people fighting for political participations and political power uh, is at the core of it's not about just, you know, if you can wear a t-shirt or not, if you can, you know, uh, travel back and forth. The other thing that I think was important is that uh, the barometer for many years of how Hong Kong was different has to do with actually Tiananmen Square. It has to do with the fact that Hong Kong was the only place in China where they were allowed to openly remember and talk about and protest what happened in Tiananmen Square. And that happened from 89 continuously until this year in 2020, where for the very first time, the Hong Kong government banned the vigil that happened and took place for 31 straight years. And I think that that's part of what I think both speaks to the rapid, you know, I think uh, sort of transformation of Hong Kong into, you know, really the least free place in China, but also speaks to the resiliency because you're talking about a city where despite the fact that they have never had a free bow and open election, they have been indoctrinated in a way, a baptized for three decades on speaking out against, you know, maybe Hong Kong government or Chinese government, remembering the atrocities, uh, valuing dissent and protest to a point where I think protest has become sort of a part of a lifestyle uh, in Hong Kong. So it's not um, surprising to me, the resiliency, the creativity and the staying power because this traced all the way back to, I think what Benny Tai, who co-founded Occupy Central is now uh, recently been fired from his tenure position in the university as a uh, academic activist say, you know, there are movements, it started in 89, they continue in 97. The third movement was 2014 in the umbrella and 2019 is the latest movement, but there is a continuity and one last point, I think, to your, what you said, Jeff, that uh, Victoria Tembohe, who's professor at Notre Dame, who's on our HKDC uh, board, would often say that this fixation on Tenement being sort of the, the bloodshed really does, as you said, take away from the fact that Tenement has been happening every day since June 4th, 89. People have been taken to jail, family has been held hostage, Every dissident has either been exiled, convicted, imprisoned every day in every part of China since 89. And so I think that to, um, to really fully appreciate where this movement, this resistance in Hong Kong represent, uh, it's important to fill in that gap between 89 and 2019, because that's how you come to appreciate and understand the, the, both the, 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 the challenge, but also the resiliency. So we're getting some wonderful questions and I'm trying to think of how to bring them in, but I'll, I'll raise a few of them and then um, you can choose which one to bring in or to answer and I will too. 
Uh, one is where Taiwan fits into this situation. Um, and I think it's, it's very important because when Hong Kong was offered this sort of deal of one country, two systems, you can be part of the country, but have a high degree of uh, autonomy. There was the hope that this would be something that people in Taiwan could look at and think of as a possible way of their integration in. And one of the um, banners that I remember very well from going over during uh, Occupy Central, the umbrella movement, was there was a banner that was put up that said, um, Taiwan beware, Hong Kong today could be your tomorrow. Whereas when the deal was initially set, uh, Beijing was saying, Taiwan, look at Hong Kong, there today could be your tomorrow. And there's been a switch um, to that. So that's one question. Another question was um, what to make of the, the special role of youth in the protests. Um, that I think is significant in part simply because young people have more skin in the game with this. They're going to live more of their life after this 2047 moment when, even, when none of the promises, whether uh, upheld or not, will be, will be taken. And, and there was a question of what American protesters might learn from Hong Kong at a moment when our own democracy is in, um, is, is under such threat. And, and maybe more generally what, I, I'll just say personally, one of the things that I've learned, uh, I've come to feel differently about the United States as I've been um, tracking Hong Kong so carefully, was even though Hong Kong movement is described as a democracy movement often, what people have often been fighting for is a separation of powers. And we've realized in this country recently how twinned those kinds of concerns are, being able to vote and also having a separation of powers. And so those are three very big uh, issues. But before we um, bring Congresswoman uh, Katy Perry in to join us, I wonder if- Wait, is it Katy Porter and Katy Perry? <laughs> Katy Porter. Oh my gosh. I Terrible. We'll have to record that for Congresswoman so that she knows. I, I have to. I have to watch so careful. Well, she was just trending on on Twitter, <laughs> but not trending uh, on Twitter for the reasons that uh, the other KD is. Um, so, while we're waiting, um, so, which of these? Any pick anyone. Yeah, I'll, pick I'll take a on, snap. Pick youth or pick. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll take a snap, and then I think that uh, I, I'll, I'm interested to hear both of you. Um, you know, there's a lot of this uh, dynamic of, you know, as you said, uh, there used to be the slogan of Hong Kong today, Taiwan tomorrow, uh, in a positive, or at least a manufactured positive sense of like, if one country two system works for Hong Kong, it can work for Taiwan. Um, it, now it's really seen as sort of the, the negative of like, this is going to happen to you, Taiwan, uh, if you ever get close to making a similar deal that there, this is how it's going to look. And I will even take the, um, the connection or the contrast further uh, to this uh, connection to our current American democracy. I say to Americans all the time, beware Hong Kong today, America tomorrow, because this is what happens when you destroy and erode any sort of political democratic institutions, when you erase this you know, uh, separation of power when you tell people that you no longer have any political agency individually, you know, when you let market capitalism be the driving sort of, you know, policy all the way through from housing to uh, welfare to, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, political elections, it becomes, you know, people sometimes are, are shocked to discover that half of the legislature in Hong Kong are elected by businesses. Like, this is what you get when you have this uh, disregard to political democratic institutions. May it be an election, may it be the courts, may it be just, you know, a vibrant civic life. Hong Kong is actually where we're all headed with that in mind. And so I think that, you know, both in terms of Taiwan, I think the Taiwan, um, you know, there's, there's definitely this connection, obviously, much more urgent, you know, uh, of Hong Kong becoming the model that Hong, China, uh, Taiwan is going to get swallowed with. 
Uh, but I see this as a global issues. I think that democracy is under attack everywhere because democratic institutions that we see right before our eyes that are being disassembled in Hong Kong and actually in America, um, it, it's actually very much a parallel track. Mary Kay, where do you want to jump in? Yeah, a few things. Um, you guys both answered the Taiwan question really well, but I'll add to that and say that I think that there are potentially a couple of other ramifications. One of them is on China's Belt and Road Initiative. You know, countries around the world are making deals with the Chinese government. And, you know, they look and say, okay, well, with Hong Kong, you had a deal and you didn't keep it. So what does that mean for us? And I'm not sure how much that's consciously being said, I don't, you know, publicly, but it's certainly something that I've heard um, ordinary people, academics, people in think tanks say in different parts of the world as they're looking at the Belt and Road. And there certainly has been some reconsideration over the last couple of years, not just over the last few months, about like how close do we actually want to be, how indebted do we actually want to be to China, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of anything, in terms of owing them a, a favor or owing them access or something like that. Also, one thing we haven't really touched on other than saying that businesses, um, business people are, are overrepresented uh, when choosing a, a chief executive in Hong Kong um, is Hong Kong has been a center of, of business, you know, and it's worked for China to have Hong Kong be a center of business for a long time. And since the handover, keeping this civil society space in Hong Kong has been attractive for international businesses to come in. So the Chinese government seems to be making a bet now that its economy is strong enough and it has other alternative financial centers in Shanghai and Shenzhen, which is more tech, but they also have a stock exchange, um, that they don't really need Hong Kong anymore. And so it doesn't matter if Hong Kong has that space and it's become annoying for Hong Kong to have that space. So they're kind of shutting it down. And, I, and that's a gamble. And I'm not sure that's going to work well for them in the long run, um, particularly at a time when, you know, China's President Xi Jinping is also saying quite openly, you know, we're going to have this military civil fusion policy. We want the military and the civilian side of things, state-owned enterprises and private companies to work together. We all need to march together to make China, you know, to have China take its rightful place in the world. You know, that sends a signal outside of China, um, in addition to what's happening in Hong Kong. All of that said, I need to push back ever so gently, Samuel, about one thing you said, and that is, um, I think there are parts of China that do feel um, quite under siege, like Xinjiang, like Tibet. Um, I have talked to civil rights lawyers in Hong Kong, in Beijing who were abducted from their offices as they were leaving to go home to their families and you know, kept in an undisclosed location and beaten up. But for the vast majority of Chinese people, and I say this having lived in China for 15 years and having reported in every province many times, um, that most people just don't feel that. I think for most people, and this is I think how the government is able to continue to uh, have a, a, a pretty substantial amount of support from the general population, uh, you know, that feels proud that China's economy is strong, or it has been up and, you know, this year hasn't been great for it, but it's doing better than a lot of other economies. Um, and it's, it's just an interesting set of um, trade-offs that I've seen people accept, you know, I mean, I live a comfortable life, I have a lot of conveniences through using WeChat, for instance, okay, the government's collecting a lot of data on me. I don't have anything to hide. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. So um, I think that there's a, there, there isn't a sense in China that I get from, that I have gotten from most people I talk to of we're oppressed, please save us. It's, you know, you Western journalists, you make a big deal out of these things. And some of the very people who say this then are surprised when they have problems down the line. Um, because the government is what it is, and it's, it mostly leaves people alone until they do exactly what people in Hong Kong have been used to doing for many years, which is speaking their minds and pushing back when they feel that something is happening that's unjust. 
Um, so, you know, the government's sort of trying to squeeze Hong Kong now into that same space where you don't try to figure out where the, where the edges of the cage are. You know, you just if, if, as long as you don't push for the edges, everything will be fine. That's the deal they want Hong Kongers to accept. Actually, that, that metaphor you use, Li Jia Zhang, a writer who I um, enjoy reading, had this very metaphor of talking about, you know, Tiananmen made you aware of a cage. And then afterwards, the cage, if the bars get moved out further and further away, then it's much easier to imagine that, that, that you're free. And I think it is important to realize there are different ways of experiencing life in different parts of of China and of the People's Republic of China. And I think it's also important to realize with something you were saying, Mary Kay, about the assets, the special aspects of Hong Kong that were assets to Beijing that became somewhat less important over time. Uh, the metaphor that's used for this has always been the golden, the goose that lays the golden eggs. And I think some of the way we, we hear about how the Chinese economy has grown, so the special role the contributing part of the Hong Kong economy, it's a less, um, it's a less precious golden egg than it was in 1997 when there was no other um, developed city of this, the same kind. But one of the things that I think the international community has to answer for, including the part of the international community I'm part of, the academic world, is we've been party to, in some ways, devaluing some of the things that were so precious in Hong Kong. And I'll give the example of universities. When Hong Kong became part of the PRC and the Chinese Communist Party cared about rankings, they wanted to have the best of things in the world. The only universities in the People's Republic of China that were considered first class were the ones in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong HKU, University of Hong Kong, Chinese University of Hong Kong, these stood head and shoulders above even the most storied universities on the mainland, like uh, Peking University and Tsinghua University, in any kind of rankings, because they had academic freedom and they had a kind of spirit of critical inquiry. One of the things that's happened during the last couple of decades is that the international community to some extent has said that institutions like, um, like Beijing uh, Dashue and Tsinghua are considered first class. They're rising above the Hong Kong universities, even though they have constraints on critical inquiry, even though they have purges uh, underway, including now, of um, critical thinkers in fields like law and history. But if they have state-of-the-art labs, if they have state-of-the-art facilities, then even things like the Times Higher Education Supplement in the UK ranks them above the Hong Kong ones. And then in a sense for Beijing to clamp down on academic freedom and freedom of inquiry in Hong Kong isn't squandering a resource as much. I mean, it's a roundabout way of saying it, but I think there is a kind of global complicity in not uh, treasuring the things that would, would stand out there. The same way that the assault on freedom of the press and the assault on journalists in Hong Kong is facilitated by the fact that there have been, there have been attacks on journalists uh, in the United States and in other parts uh, of the world. So um, with, with that, I, I am gonna um, pivot now to bring Congresswoman Katie Porter into the discussion. And I wanna say it's a, it's a really great pleasure for us to be able to bring um, the Congresswoman in as a special guest. We thought it was a great privilege from, um, from the beginning and then actually seeing, um, seeing what's been saying, very positive things being said about her, uh, cross-examination uh, trending on Twitter right now, it's even more, more of a pleasure. It's also a personal pleasure because she is my, um, she's my representative. And I can say um, with direct experience, uh, not from my own interactions, but with people I know, that she has a reputation here of being very responsive to local concerns, being somebody who local constituents can go to with pragmatic problems or with their moral concerns, and she's responsive. And at the same time, she's somebody who is very active in national concerns 
and will take the time to pay attention to global and international concerns as well. And so I think that's really a kind of modeling of political and civic engagement uh, that we need um, to celebrate. And um, so to bring the Congresswoman up to speed a bit, we've been discussing various aspects of the Hong Kong situation from the history of protests there to the tightening of controls on the city. And we've also talked about how events in Hong Kong fit in with trends across the People's Republic of China and to some extent in a larger international setting that we haven't really dealt with US-China relations yet. But to bring you into the discussion, I thought maybe the best way to start would just be to ask you to say a bit about what you find most concerning about the current situation in Hong Kong and often offer your perspective on how the American government has responded so far and could respond. So welcome, um, welcome to this session. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. It's so nice to see you, Jeff. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having me um, and for the very kind introduction, um, Jeff. And I want to thank the LA Review of Books and the Hong Kong Democracy Council for putting this event together. Um, this is really a time in which we need to be having conversations. And I think last night's debate illustrated just how difficult those are to come by right now in our society. Um, so really grateful for you for facilitating this discussion. Um, you know, I wish there was an easy answer right now, um, kind of to what I find most concerning. Um, but there's, there's a number of items um, and a number of things. Um, so I wanted to run through a, a little bit of my own background and connection to Hong Kong um, to kind of set the stage. So um, when I graduated from college in 1996, I wanted to teach. And I had taught middle school kids throughout my time in college. And so I was hired to teach at the Hong Kong International School. And I taught eighth grade math, which apparently nobody has ever volunteered to teach in the history of time. Um, but that was my number one choice, eighth grade math. Um, and when I went to Hong Kong, this is the sort of significant part. I graduated from college in 1996. So I went to Hong Kong for the first time in the fall of 1996, and then stayed through the handover the transition in 1997. Um, and that was a time that was you know, really, really interesting to be in Hong Kong in that period, um, both to see how Americans were reacting to it, but also to see both some of the hopes and anxieties of the people of Hong Kong at that time. Um, and then also the relationship of the huge expat community that's been part of Hong Kong's history for a very long time. Um, and somehow they were dealing with um, this change. Um, and so I think we would all, so it was a moment in which I think there was a, a sense of um, foreboding about what the future might hold, but kind of in the moment, it was really dealt with as a celebration, certainly by the Chinese, right? I mean, you will never see fireworks like that ever again. Um, it was truly I mean, hours. I love fireworks and they were so long I actually got bored. I mean three hours in I've seen it all right. Um, but they think there was a sense of foreboding about whether what we were seeing in that moment was going to be the enduring relationship um, between China and Hong Kong and I think that's where we find ourselves today is some of those concerns have come true. Um, and so you know, when we think about the national security law, one of the things that immediately jumps out to me is, I don't think it's a coincidence that this happened at this moment. I think it came at this moment, not only because of things about Hong Kong and things about China, but really because of where the world is. Um, the United States is distracted, importantly so, um, you know, really focusing on coronavirus. We have that, you know, very high death rate. We do not have this virus under control. We do not have a coordinated national plan. Um, and so, you know, I think Beijing understood that the United States is not going to be moving um, even really, really important foreign policy issues to the top of the agenda when we're dealing with both a huge national election and a pan an out of control pandemic. And of course the pandemic has affected every country but I, I think there was an opportunistic sort of moment strategy here with the timing. And I think this illustrates a really basic truth, which uh, many of you may have heard about foreign policy. You can't have strength abroad without strength at home. And I'm not just talking about the coronavirus. I'm also thinking about 
our own fragile democracy and the degree to which we are having trouble defending, shoring up, and stabilizing some of our own democratic institutions. Um, and I think that also creates a kind of ideal moment for Beijing to take action with regard to Hong Kong. Um, and so I think what I find really concerning is this gulf between where we are as a country in America um, and where we need to be as a country in order to be an effective champion for human rights, an effective advocate for democracy, um, a broker of peace, all of these things. Um, we're not well positioned right now with our current leadership economically um, or sort of in terms of our, our social institutions to be playing that really, really important role. And that's not to say that Congress hasn't taken action or that we don't care about what's going on, because we, we do and we have taken steps. Um, Congress blocked the sale of riot equipment um, to Hong Kong. We've condemned the national security law. We've authorized new sanctions. And I was proud to vote for all of those bills. But I will tell you, just in coming to you from Washington, walking the halls of Congress today, there's a lot of walking in Congress, um, walking those halls, this is not at the front and the center, right? And that's because our own domestic problems are substantial and severe. Um, and so I think we have to be honest with ourselves about even as we've taken these, these bills, I think these bills are good, that's why I voted for them. Um, but these bills send, um, you know, they send an unequivocal message about our American values and our priorities, um, but they're not gonna change Chinese behavior. Um, and I don't think we should be kidding ourselves about them. Um, they're sending the right message, they're making the right noises, they're not going to likely change the effective policy um, on the ground. And I think if anything, the repression in Hong Kong is getting more intense as time goes on. Um, and I think you could say the same thing about the situation in um, uh, Xinjiang. I mean, it's just, it's, it's continuing to be um, a problem. So when you ask me about what I think about the response, you know, what I see in Hong Kong is a microcosm of so many of the challenges we're facing in U.S. foreign policy generally. Um, you know, it's clear that China is a problem um, in many, many parts and pockets of the world, including in Hong Kong. It's a problem because we believe there are fundamental rights to freedom of religion, freedom of expression, um, and they're not on freedom of speech. They're not honoring those rights. It's a problem because China is the world's largest greenhouse gas polluter. And we cannot meaningfully ta tackle climate change without their cooperation. And it's a problem because China has economic and military power that is, that is formidable. And they can use that power to create and to shape a less free and democratic world. And I think all of those problems with China are growing rather than receding. Um, and so I think that, you know, while these sanctions, um, you know, and, and increased defense spending, the kind of tools that Congress tends to reach for are important, um, they're not gonna be by themselves a solution. Um, and so I think first and most importantly, Americans have no interest in some kind of new Cold War. That's, that's not appealing right now to people. This is a time of domestic disagreement um, and we've seen domestic you know, rioting and protests over civil unrest, very important issues here. Um, and so to the extent people are inside the beltway or trying to gin this up as a new Cold War, I don't think there's an appetite for that among the American people. Um, Second, were, they, were there to be some kind of new Cold War, I think it would be coming at the expense of being able to have a meaningful dialogue and make meaningful progress on climate change with China. Um, and I think that is going to increasingly be an overriding goal of our foreign policy, including even our military policy um, explicitly. And so I think Hong Kong should be a lesson for us that the current approach isn't enough to change Chinese behavior. Um, so I think we know that our approach to the world needs to change, but it's hard to build, you know, it's hard to put kind of our foreign policy approach on a bumper sticker. You just can't fit the word multilateral, you know, the phrase build multilateral institutions. I mean, even soft power, it sounds like a bad vegetable, like or a squishy marshmallow. Soft power doesn't sound it sounds like something you learned at like a women's seminar, like use your soft power, right? So these multi, this concept of building multilateral institutions and soft power, I don't, I think there are, it's difficult for them to compete in the very noisy policy sphere 
um, with kind of the saber rattling tactics on the other side. Um, and so I think we want to be, you know, Democrats want to be championing democracy and human rights, but they're also really worried about feeding President Trump's xenophobic fear mongering about Chinese Americans and to some extent about China as a power. Um, there's a sense that he's exploiting our concerns about China to gain his, his own political gain rather than to actually meaningfully address um, the human rights concerns in Hong Kong. Um, and so at times I think we, because of that, we've seeded the conversation on Hong Kong um, to some Republicans who are frankly very happy um, to talk about democracy in China, even as they're making it harder for us to exercise our own democracy here. Um, and so I think to some extent that was our, our path of least resistance. Um, so it was an attempt to create a bipartisan response to Hong Kong, um, but it, was, it ended up being pretty unproductive. So to cl kind of close my opening, long opening thoughts here, um, with respect to what our response could look like in the future, I think the first and most important step is to get Democrats really out there and on board doing the work um, and showing people that we are fighting the same fight as Hong Kongers um, here and there, um, that there is a, a commonality among what the Hong Kong people are going through in terms of struggling to protect their freedoms, struggling to hang on to some of their um, you know, limited democratic freedoms with what we're seeing here. And this is very different, I think, from the historical, look at us, we're the bastion of democracy, you all need to be more like us. We're in a situation where a lot of the world is saying, yeah, look at you, look at, look at what's going on with your elections. Look at, look at some of the human rights concerns within your own country. Look at the own, for example, the exercise of police power here in the United States. And then you, you know, to critique the Hong Kong police becomes a more complicated dialogue. Um, and so I, I think that sort of put a frame on it. That's how I really think about putting it in context here in a very noisy policy space in Washington. So that's, that's really great. And one thing that's wonderful about it is you answered without knowing they were being asked a couple of the questions that came in from the audience, one of which was whether the Democrats had ceded to the Republicans the lead in this kind of um, that I think you 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 framed that 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 very well. The only the only thing I would add, just because I'm a moderator but also participant, is that the thing that you do not want to do in this situation is praise an autocratic leader in China, praise them personally at the moment when there's a personality cult of Xi, that's one of the things that's driving the tightening of controls is the distraction of the world, but another is um, the need for a nationalistic leader like Xi Jinping to be able to point to things in which he's extended the reach and the power of Beijing. And so to praise his personal qualities, to say he's a strong figure who can get things done is has been precisely the wrong signaling that's been coming uh, from the White House. But I'd like to get um, Mary Kay or Samuel in to respond to or ask questions of the Congresswoman uh, from yeah. here. Um, so Congresswoman, it's great to see you. Um, and uh, I, I just uh, quick, I don't even remember, but uh, we actually, I, we first met when you became, actually the week before you became the inspector for the California uh, uh, settlement with the banks, uh, I hosted you actually in Pacoima, uh, Los Angeles. Do you remember uh, this? <laughs> I do. Um, and we, we were we were in a church, if I recall right. Yeah, we actually went to a couple of different places. Yeah, and we, we yeah. showed you some of the cases of the mortgage modification plans that we had been organizing yeah. with families. And and it actually, I, 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 I will always remember because you, actually had not taken the job. You were not on the job yet. You came before you took the job to come and, and visit with our families that we were working with uh, that were in foreclosure. And, and this, I think, ties into kind of where I am as, you know, as the person who um, have looked at both I'm so glad you said that, by the way, Samuel, because for about the last 15 minutes, I've been trying to place you. <laughs> So the person on this call that I was like, oh, I might recognize him from around the neighborhood was Jeff. So I've been trying to place you for like the last 15 minutes. So thank you for, no. for clearing and, that uh, up for me. I, I, like, I, I will always remember and um, because it's, I mean, how eager and, and just available you were. 
and I, I tied, you know, I bring that up not just to, um, I mean, just to help you solve your 15 minute mystery, but to also say that um, one of the things that in learning, you know, I've been an organizer for domestic issues and now for the last, you know, really a few years has been on Hong Kong because it's a personal issue to me. But in the economic crisis and great recessions, uh, in the foreclosure crisis that we were both involved in, in helping dissolve, what became clear to people was how rigged the system was. It was sort of a revelation to people that, wait, what do you mean that this didn't just happen overnight? Right. And, and I think that that, in a way, was the, was the most powerful uh, exposure people had to why democracy matters, the democratic process matters, because you can actually figure out a way to hold them accountable to stem the problem from continuing and to restructure the system, um, you know, to reform the system in a way that is permanent. That in a way is a parallel to, you know, I, before you join it, we talked a lot about how Hong Kong in the last six years became clear to Hong Kongers that the system was rigged against them fundamentally. And you know, in a lot of ways, they were much more focused and narrow in the fact that they didn't have any political agency and didn't have any political rights under the current system. And now has actually even have what little they had have taken away. So I guess my question to you is that I'm interested in your take about um, how, without an election process, without a democratic government in Hong Kong that, you know, has now been completely decimated at any kind of representation, how do we also help do what you're describing of this facilitate supporting this organizing on the ground that translates sort of this aware realization that the system is rigged we got to do something about it but we can't actually go vote or run for office like he did and, and actually change it i think there's a sense of stuckness about what is the next step how do we connect this discontent this despair and this uh, anger around the system being rigged to real transformation, particularly in a oppressive authoritarian state now in Hong Kong? Yeah, no, I think it's a wonderful question. And, you know, I, I, I thought a lot about, well, actually the connection between consumer protection, which is my background, um, and freedom of expression, which maybe are not the two things that people would put right next to each other as, so I had a conversation, you know, with David Kay, who's just retired as, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression. And one of the things that we talked about is when I've done some consumer protection work in foreign countries, one of the things, and the example here I'll give is Myanmar. One of the things I came away from spending time there trying to help them to build and implement their consumer protection law was what they really needed was Yelp. In other <laughs> words, they really needed a way to complain and not be silenced, right? And to organize and to share information with each other. Um, and I think that, you know, there are multiple ways that we create power um, and move power socially. And obviously democracy and voting um, is one of them. I think actually there are some lessons that a lot of Americans are asking themselves about, you know, look at the fragility of a democracy right, um, with 2016. Um, you know, we elected my class in 2018 saying we're gonna, you know, this will, great, like this will be a check. And yes, we have been a check in some ways on the Trump agenda, but in other ways, foreign affairs being a really good example, we haven't been able to, to be much of a, meaning, to meaningfully be direct. There's a lot of presidential power there. Um, so I, I think one of the things for people to, to think about is the importance of, um, you know, how do you build that organizing power um, at the ground level? Um, how do you name really what the forces are that are oppressing you? And I think it's, you know, I think we, the government is the obvious one here, but there's a whole um, host of organizations with in this space that are also connected to that. Um, the higher education system, um, some of the corporate, the corporations that are there. I mean, these are also, powerful forces that are that are um, exerting control, right? And, and so I don't know if I have a good answer for that, but I, I do think that, um, you know, you can, if you let this kind of situation fester, you can actually lose the energy and the spirit of a whole generation or more of people.
and it's not easy to get back, right? Um, and so I think it's really important that we stand up for Hong Kongers now, um, that we nurture um, their concerns, that we amplify um, their concerns, um, and that we don't see it that to, to xenophobia or, or pushing against China, but really standing up for the rights of Hong Kongers, right? Um, and so I think that's one helpful way to approach it. Okay, do you want to think about and say, because um, because as you were speaking, Samuel, I, I was my my mind went to like if you're in a society where your your rights are being squeezed, and there isn't a clear path forward to a situation in which they're not being, as long as Xi Jinping is in power, what can you do? And I think you can actually take a page from. Chinese online over the last decade who have found extremely creative ways to express criticisms, to be snide and sarcastic and satirical, and, you know, satire and humor um, in, in, in the East Bloc, you know, in the, in, when the Soviet Union still existed and in China over the time that I was there, plays a crucial role in keeping people aware and in keeping people on, you know, kind of an, you know, keeping people sharp, thinking what's really going on around me and sharing that with others. And it also creates a sense of community uh, or, or sustains a sense of community. And I think in China, there was a real high point in like 2011 when the high speed train um, crashed and, uh, you know, there was this outcry on social media that was so great that the Chinese government was like, holy heck, we need to shut this down. You know, we know where this is going. Um, but there's a lot you can do beneath the surface. And also in China, you know, over the course of the time I was there in the, you know, 2003 to 2013, as long as police were still publishing each year how many protests there were, they were in like high tens of thousands, over 100,000. You know, one year, I think it was 2010, it was like 180,000 protests. So there actually is room for some protests, but I think at the moment, the government's hyper vigilant because it's like, you guys all want to separate. We can't let you do that. We've got to just keep squeezing you until you stop doing that. And then once we think you're loyal, we'll let you have some of the little protests that you used to have, which weren't all against China, right? You know, the Hong Kongers have been protesting all kinds of things over the course of the last 20 years. Um, so, I mean, I think part of it is just play the long game and use all the tools you can. Um, and not all of them are like a direct straight on confrontation with, you know, the highest leaders in China, but they can still kind of get you to a place where you, you preserve some of the space as much as possible <laughs> of, of what Hong Kong has had. I, I, I think talking about the long game and talking about um, subtle forms of resistance is really important now to think about. And going back to something Samuel said earlier, Hong Kong has always has been a colonial setting, anti-colonial movements. It was a colony of Britain. And now increasingly with the national security law being imposed by Beijing, it's clearly that a distant capital is once again uh, not as distant, but a distant capital is imposing its will. Anti-colonial movements take a very long, t sometimes take a very long time and often seem utterly hopeless at one stage in their history. And movements in the Eastern Bloc, if you thought of it kind of rationally, why are people in Prague in 1968 rising up? In 56, it was repressed in Hungary. And then after 68 is repressed in Prague, they rise up in Poland again in the late 90, in the late 70s. And then in the early 80s, it seemed that Poland was a dead end. It was a failure. But then things change in the world, different spaces open up. There's, there's the possibility, things that seem impossible sometimes do happen. I, I don't think that there's an inevitability about where the arc of history bends, but to try to keep bending it in the direction you want, even when it seems it seems um, impossible. There was, there was one question, um, again, about, one question was about the awkwardness, and I think Samuel maybe would be good to ask this, to answer this. What is it, how does it feel when you're a Hong Konger fighting for certain kinds of things, and your allies are people who 
often have, you're a progressive on many levels, and the people who are your natural allies are often um, regressive in their policies uh, domestically. But before, before I have get your response, I just want to say, because um, the Congresswoman brought up the difficulty of having um, civil debate on anything in America right now. There's a model of wonderfully civil debate in a recent issue of The Nation magazine where Wilfred Chan and Jeffrey Ngo, who are in different wings within the Hong Kong struggle within the United States, Jeffrey is somebody that Samuel works with closely. Wilfred is somebody who's much further along on the left. And the two of them have this exchange about whether American support should be sought, whether you find alliances with people you disagree with on many things. And what's, what's beautiful about it, it's really beautiful, is the two of them clearly have so much respect for each other, even though this is an ongoing disagreement on strategy and tactics. And so I just think it's something I look forward to teaching just as a model for the kind of debate that is a real debate in which each person has the potential to be influencing somebody else. But I, I'd like to get your response, Samuel, and then we can bring the Congresswoman back in as well. So when I first met the Congresswoman in, the, in, the, in that um, time when we were working for mortgage, uh, I was uh, working uh, with families who were underwater in their, in their uh, mortgages, and we eventually got a $25 billion uh, settlement from the banks. I think that uh, the I was taught and, and I made a choice early on in my career to work in politics as defined in the broadest sense of the word. I think right now we're in a moment where people think about politics, they only think about partisan politics. They may think about electoral politics, but I have, even before working in Hong Kong, has always believed that my job as an organizer, as an activist, or whatever you want to call it, is to cultivate political people in the more pluralistic, diverse, complex sense of the word. Meaning that I want people to understand that they themselves have more than one interest. Because I support Hong Kong doesn't represent and define all my other politics. And I think that this is where we are at now in space. I think that in some way, uh, my friends and colleagues would probably secretly accuse me, this is sort of my, my secret agenda in working on Hong Kong beyond, you know, really wanting to, to create and, and, you know, this, this free and democratic Hong Kong is to also open up this space to not be stuck and say that you have to allow your Hong Kong politics or China politics to define all your politics and all your self-interest and all your political interests. It is not a secret prior to this, I worked on anti-poverty, uh, mostly food and security policies. Um, uh, I, before that, I worked on gay marriage uh, and helped to secure the, the, the rights for gay uh, um, individuals and families, uh, both from marriage to adoption to all the other things. Uh, and, and it's not a secret that I think, uh, for me, the so-called awkwardness, for me, has to do with a more vibrant democracy. I have no permanent enemies and permanent friends because in the democratic process, I'm, as you can tell, I'm well trained by Saul Alinsky. Um, uh, you know, I came out of the Chicago organizing tree and, and, and I was taught that building political power and being able to build and embody sort of democratic values does not mean you are a narrow partisan or a um, person who only works with one group. What does that mean though, is that I found myself quite frankly in a lot of places where I have, I'm in relationship working with people on one thing where I disagree with them adamantly on others. And having that relationship allows me to do that, right? I mean, that's the good part about this is that if I'm never actually examining our shared interests or where we might be able to make some compromise, then I'm never able to actually confront people on places where we do differ. And, and I think that that's part of where I think, what, and I, I, I do think we're in a little bit of a danger here of everything at this point being scooped up with politics being defined by partisanship 
and not negotiation, deliberation, self-examinations, and compromise. So I think that's that's partly where I am. And I think that um, the Congresswoman is a great example of this, of uh, the, connecting the dots between domestic. We should never be afraid to speak about the fragileness of American democracy, because that is part of the, the, the strength that we draw from to speak for Hong Kong in America. Well, I really, I really like that point about um, kind of, you know, honoring, I guess I would say, the fragility of democracy um, and understanding that as an American strength, um, understanding that it's fragile because it requires so much of each of us, not of me, elected official, not right, but of each of us. And, and that makes it both very, very strong, um, very, very resilient maybe is a better word, and yet very, very fragile. Um, and so I think, you know, when we talk about working across the aisle, you know, it's very clear that the American people, when you poll on this, or you talk, everybody loves this concept. Then you do it, and they're like, I can't believe you could ever have a bill with so-and-so, right? So I you know, have a particular bill with a particular Republican member, uh, Dan Crenshaw. I don't have a lot in common with Dan. Okay, that's the understatement of the century. But we're working together to crack down on scam packs. And that is the right policy for the American people. Um, and so I you think you do learn I mean, part of being able to negotiate effectively for what you believe in is having a good understanding of alternate perspectives. And you get that from having those those moments. So I think, I think, you know, there's a big difference from what we've seen in Congress to return to Hong Kong to a minute, for a minute, what we've seen in Congress, which is, you know, bipartisan bills, an effort to, to kind of return to stating collective core principles, and sort of the saber rattling of the Trump administration, um, which I think is, is, really more about Trump's self-interest than it is about advancing the situation of Hong Kongers, um, right? So some of that I think is, is more about, you know, feeding into his um, narrative about American military might um, and not understanding that there are so many ways in which the largest threats that China presents to us are you know, traditionally military, right? Um, so, I, I think that's a really interesting observation about sort of you know, the fragility of democracy and people kind of saying, well, does that make us weak? I would say that makes us strong because it requires and calls on us to be well, more like Samuel, right? Little, like little P political, right? Um, in that kind of broad way that you were describing. So I'd like to have uh, ask Irene to read off some questions. We've got a lot of questions um, coming in. Um, so do you want to hop in and read some out so that we can try to, we're nearing the end, but we want to get some of these in. Sure. Um, it looks like um, there's a question from Madeline Sue. The national security law projects authority over persons outside of China's geographic jurisdiction and not just persons with Chinese citizenship or acting within Chinese jurisdiction. How likely is the Chinese government to pursue extraterritorial prose prosecution of non-Chinese citizens, uh, critics and protesters? And I would imagine Sam you know, maybe this <laughs> might be a good well, question. I, I will quickly you. just say this. I mean, I think uh, I, I uh, when I woke up, actually, I woke up from text telling me that I had an arrest warrant. Um, I ran into uh, Mr. McGovern, um, uh, who has been a champion in Congress for us last week in, in D.C., and he was like, just stay close to the U.S. Uh, don't go to China, uh, because that's probably not a good idea. But all joking aside, I, I think that here's where I think we see some of the traditional tactic that CCP uses, which is, I think, leveraging sort of the threat, not just of, you know, limiting my travel is not necessarily going to be a big deal. But, you know, my family lives in Hong Kong. I think that's a big part of this. Uh, but to your question, I think that that is what the intent is. I think that uh, what China, I think, authorities saw this past year is the vibrancy and the creativity, not just on the ground in Hong Kong, but overseas. The fact that we were able to build bipartisan policy to go through Congress in a time like this to get support of the Human Rights and Democracy Act, the Protect Hong Kong Act, the Autonomy Act, and actually get those things done in a bipartisan way, really, I think, woke up the Chinese authority where they said, we can't just control them here. 
we have to somehow try to control them over there. And so I would say that I'm not waiting for a knock on my door. I've been reassured uh, by State Department and, uh, and we have not seen any legal paperwork. Nobody has said that Interpol has not been contacted. There has not been a red notice. But I think that what it is trying to do is to say that we are going to test out how far we can go, especially when you know we have shown that uh, Chinese government has not been shy about taking hostages, literally of foreign citizens in China. And so I think that they're trying to test out and I think that the way we respond and uh, to, to these threats are gonna be uh, case by case, are gonna be meaningful. Uh, it shows the Chinese authority and it shows people in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong authorities that we're not going to sort of back down just because we're not paying attention. But I think another thing that's important to keep in mind with what they're doing with you, Samuel, is um, setting an example. And, and, and the Chinese government does this within China all the time, where you, you do something where they're like, and we can, we can do this. And not necessarily just for people born in Hong Kong, but under the national security law, they could charge anyone with committing what they consider a crime in China you know, in the United, if, if you do say something or do something in the United States or in Britain or wherever you are, and then you go into Hong Kong or China, you could be arrested. I'm pretty sure that the congressmen who voted on those bills have violated all the uh, uh, <laughs> provisions. And so um, I, I, I did actually, when they came, uh, the reporter asked me how I feel about being wanted. I said, I will lead them. If they come arrest me, I'll lead them down to, to Congress uh, and they can arrest every member of Congress who voted for the Human Rights and Democracy Act. Mm -hmm. That's right, I want to send you the bus, Samuel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so we have uh, maybe two questions that we can kind of think about together. Um, so one of our attendees has asked, how would you define the political leanings or affiliations of the Hong Kong movement as it stands? leftist, centrist, some other definition or imagination of political beliefs. Um, and maybe relatedly, um, there have been some criticisms of the Hong Kong protests not being representative of or led by the most vulnerable communities in Hong Kong. What material benefits does this protest yield for lower class and marginalized folks in Hong Kong? Well, I, I would just say, again, with this um, exchange in the nation, it was very exciting to see uh, an exchange between a kind of uh, center left and further left, that the fact there is discussion going on there, I think is very important. And there are ways that you can get access to the different wings of this discussion in English language materials. The Lao San Collective is a group of um, commentators who are pushing for more class solidarity, more emphasis on building unions, more emphasis on uh, the socioeconomic kinds of issues that whereas we often get the voices of the the part within the movement that are more of a kind of classic focusing on um, human rights and electoral um, democratic issues so you have access to that um, through 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 these debates so I think there's a range and I think what what was notable about the movement last year was how the protests spread to all different districts of Hong Kong, whereas earlier protests had tended to be centered in some parts of them, and all different segments of society. Not that there weren't tensions, but you had very young protesters and much older protesters turning out in their roles as elders of the community who saw a role in supporting the youth of the community. So it was a very, uh, there was a lot of modeling of that crossing solidarity, not to romanticize it too much, and it's under such pressure that there are bound to be divisions. But that, was, that would be one um, answer, I think, to that first question. And I would just add, I think, uh, briefly that um, I, I think, again, I, um, the, sometimes it, it is hard because when you're fighting, you know, when it's framed around um, that this fight is against an authoritarian regime, it seems like that is sort of the, the one thing that you can focus on. Um, and, I, I do think that um, it's not, uh, I, I actually resonate with what the Congresswoman said that sometimes you, you really have to be very consistent in the small things to chip at it, you know, and, and be able to, and I think you see that. Um, I think that, 
figure out the one of the reason why you know the resiliency and the creativity of the protest has been so remarkable is that you know when they were banned from large-scale protests they did their own spontaneous lunchtime mall you know singing when they can't do that then they went out and just stood there and they were then arrested and they can't you know they can't hold up the sign they just hold up a blank piece of paper and when they come arrest with a blank piece of paper they just started walking around together in the neighborhood and i think that is is that sort of um but again i think um to to the point about um i think that uh, there is always a danger of, I think, um, letting your, I think, uh, organizing and I think that the agency that you're building being co-opted by an ideology, you know, and, and being simplified. Um, this is where I think that, um, you know, I was so moved um, that, I mean, people didn't really notice the election was postponed uh, that was supposed to be in September for the legislature. Mm -hmm. People forget that in June, Benny Tai and others organized their own primary election where 600,000 people in the midst of COVID came out to vote. So I think that I am inspired and also energized by the continued creation of these sign and ritual and, you know, practices of democratic practices, even in the midst of places where you're not allowed to have it. Uh, we keep coming up with new ways to do it. I mean, 600,000 people is a lot, especially when they have told you that you can't gather more than 10 people at a time. And, and this, an earlier question had been, what can American protesters learn from Hong Kong? And I think one of the things is Hong Kong in 2019 at one level has been a failed movement but it's also been a movement that's been inspiring people in many different parts of the world. The idea of the Be Water strategy, the emphasis on flexibility, the using creative kind of very pragmatic means to combat tear gas are things that are being picked up in different places by people looking at Hong Kong. Belarus, there's been looking at Hong Kong. Thailand, there's been looking at Hong Kong. There's a looking for the common denominator of uh, desires for certain kinds of freedoms and for a more accountable government. But then there's an interest in and an inspiration. And I think that's something, I think we should have a, a, a broad view of success and failure. That you can be, a movement can fail to get what it's after in one location and still inspire people in other places. Tiananmen did, did not succeed, but the image of the tank man has inspired people different places. The failure in China in June of 1989, I've heard people in Eastern Europe say they found what happened in China so inspiring and it helped them in their struggle, even though the obvious lesson was how dangerous it is to stand up to that kind of state. So I think that's something as, as heartbreaking as the Hong Kong story is, we should think about ways in which it is having something of a generative power in adding something to the global repertoire of protest activities. I think that's really wonderful and maybe a wonderful place for us to conclude our conversation this evening. Um, on behalf of the Los Angeles Review of Books, I want to thank each of our panelists for joining us tonight and sharing uh, their really invaluable insight and expertise. Uh, I also like to thank everyone at LARC who helped make this event happen, uh, in particular our fantastic volunteers and staff this evening, Sonia Ali, Nicole Liu, Brian Spivy, and Yi Wei. Um, and all of you who are here joining us and asking some really incredible questions. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to get to all of them, um, but there's clearly a lot, a lot to discuss here. And, and maybe actually we could kind of um, leave with one of the questions I was asking about what local or international news sources to recommend reading to follow the protests. So that as people want to kind of continue learning more and follow a bit more closely, where should they go? <laughs> what should they look to? Um, you can ask, maybe we can kind of well, Let me go first because I'm going to have the least detailed answer. <laughs> so before Jeff comes up with some amazing source that's been translated from the Mandarin, um, let me pause and say just how much I like that question. 
um, because one of the things a lot, you know, I came in with a group of, of colleagues in 2018, a lot of whom have a lot of national security background. Um, some of them in the United States Armed Forces, some of them more in the foreign affairs space, like my colleague Tom Malinowski. Um, one of the things that you know, we've talked a lot about is I thought that I didn't get a lot of questions about foreign affairs or about human rights or because people didn't think I knew about these things or I was passionate about them, even though I am. But in talking to some of my colleagues, they don't get a lot of questions about some of these issues either. And so I think one of the things I would encourage people to do is actually to, to ask um, their Congress people and their elected officials and to take the time to teach them. Um, so if you're from, you know, if you have family in Hong Kong, if you were a Hong Konger, um, if you know people, those conversations and kind of elevating what's going on there directly to your elected representative, those conversations matter. And so one of the things that we've really, you know, struggled with in our offices, you know, how do we get people who are so concerned about so many issues right now domestically to also understand our role in stabilizing and improving the world. One doesn't go away as the other um, kind of rises, right? They exist in, in, simul in, in tension with each other. So um, I would just say that I encourage people to recognize their, their own selves and their own stories sometimes as a really important source of information for those of us in elected office. And I, I would just piggyback on that because actually um, I did not ask Congresswoman to, 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 to bring this up, but uh, Mr. Mer uh, Melinowski, actually we're endorsing a bill that he uh, wrote, uh, introduced today actually, uh, that will provide some protections for Hong Kong protesters who are under uh, threat for charges and arrests. Uh, and, and that's a great example of, uh, of really creating this pipeline information, um, not to, because I am biased, one of the reasons that we heard for many years on Capitol Hill is that we don't know, even lawmakers don't really know how to vet the news that were coming out from Hong Kong and China, not just because of the language differences, but because of, you know, really um, the, the challenges of just knowing who to listen to and, and who, how to decipher. And so one of the reasons why we actually created HKDC last year in the first place was that we wanted to make sure that we have at least some way of vetting and screening the information we now pass on information on a regular basis to members of Congress, we can do better. And I think that we need to do better. And this is actually true of all the places where um, we're talking about the unrest domestically and <laughs> internationally. I think, and, and this is something that I am inspired by, I think what you said, it is hard to put multilateral um, institutions on a bumper stickers. Mm -hmm. It is extremely important that we look forward to creating not just government multilateral institutions, but grassroots multilateral institutions, because some of these things like news sharing, news reporting and documentation, what's happening on the ground is that kind of institution that is needed. And so we're gonna do our best uh, at HGDC on our website, on our Facebook and social media to continue to feed and try to translate both culturally, politically and linguistically um, and, uh, and I think that Jeff and others will probably have other sources as well, but I think that that is a task I think was really essential uh, role that we must play. And, 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 and um, we're actually, um, since you mentioned it, we're sending out a survey to all, not just current office holders, but candidates for all 470 uh, members of Congress up for re-elections on November 3rd, really to ask them to you know, state some of their stands on Hong Kong issue, but really, as you said, to educate them, to for, you know, to really make uh, eat their team and their offices to think through uh, the implication of what's uh, is happening in China. So that is something that we're doing right now. And so I think that that's another great point. So I would just say uh, there is the Hong Kong Free Press, which is a um, which has been doing yeoman's work and putting reporting from the ground. Quartz has wonderful reporters on the ground in Hong Kong, um, very, one that you might not think of immediately. The Guardian has just been running a good series. The Nation and Dissent Magazine for Deeper Dives have started um, to be periodicals on the left that have been paying um, more attention to Hong Kong. The New York Times has some very good people, including Elaine Yu, who's a Hong Konger, who's beginning to um, get more bylines um, there. 
the Los Angeles Times, I, um, you know, got to stick up for the, the local team, has, been, has good reporting on, um, on Asia and has, um, you know, there could always be more, but it's had carried some very good pieces on um, repression in different parts of the PRC, including um, the Hong Kong story. So those are, those are some of the places I would say um, uh, initially. NPR also does, does good work. I'll throw in a couple as well. Um, for not just Hong Kong, but also coverage of China, and it brings in a lot of different views, um, China File, which is put together by the Asia Society. It's just a great resource for learning your way in more deeply into a lot of different issues, including those that affect Hong Kong, even if they're not directly about the Hong Kong protests. And if you really want to take a deep dive, um, cynicism, that's with an S-I-N-O-C-I-S-M, which is put together by someone named Bill Bishop. And that goes very deeply into a lot of what's going on with internal Chinese politics, which directly affects how policies are carried out in places like Hong Kong. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again so much um, for also humoring my secret last question <laughs> um, there and for joining us this evening. Um, this is really, really wonderful. We, we appreciate it so much. Um, and again, thank you to all of you who've joined us this evening um, and all of you who've helped support and make this event happen. Um, that goes beyond the staff and the volunteers that we have tonight. We rely on the support of members, donors, and engaged readers like you to keep us publishing new essays and reviews daily without paywalls and providing uh, free public programming like this. So thank you so much to everyone who's um, been a supporter and to all of you for your interest and participation tonight. Um, just a, a last announcement, this event, as many of you may know, was part of our celebration of Band Books Week. So if you'd like to support us or join us for additional programming and perks, we'd love to have you join us in the following ways. You can become a member, you can check out the podcast, books and essays, we and some independent bookstores that we partnered with have curated for the occasion. You can make a donation and get a large Band Books reader. We've put together a really great anthology of some of the best essays and interviews from our archive, tackling issues of censorship and free expression. Um, but, you know, most of all, we're just really glad that you came and participated in this conversation and had great questions. And thank you again to all of our speakers. Uh, that concludes our program for this evening. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you all again soon.